Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Maria Grigorieva, and I welcome you to uh, our today's webinar, The Future of Intercompany Finance. Uh, our today presenters are Margie van der Walk. She's a partner of TPA Amsterdam. Uh, she's uh, in uh, transfer pricing and international taxation for more than four, four, uh, 14 years. Uh, she's a master of tax law. Uh, she uh, dealt with uh, local and uh, uh, tax and transfer pricing audits and code procedures. She also participated in design and implementation of tax control framework. Our second presenter is Luan Verdoner. He's of Council of TPA in Amsterdam. Uh, he is former in-house legal and tax advisor. Uh, he has extensive knowledge of business-related and uh, transfer pricing issues. He worked on numerous uh, business restructuring projects, both in-house as a consultant. Dear participants, I welcome you. Please start the webinar. Thank you, Mary, for your introduction. My name is Marcia van der Valk, and I will be leading the first part of this presentation, and my colleague Luan will cover the second part of this webinar. The topic of today is the future of intercompany financing. However, it is important to note that intercompany financing should be looked at not only from a regulatory perspective, but also from the perspective that the economic conditions are changing in the world and so impacting the financial industry at the same time. The OECD BEPS action plan has major implications for both financial and non-financial intercompany transactions. The question arises how to deal with the pricing of these transactions under these circumstances. The economic climate change is impacting all companies, including the dy dynamics in the financial industry. With this backdrop, I will start with the first observation on the economic climate, and we will continue with slide four. Um, yeah. um, the two worlds, the, U the EU and the US on the one side, and the emerging markets on the other side have both been important pillars for economic growth. However, as we have seen, from 2008, the economic downturn started and many companies went down. We see that the US is recovering since two years, but most of the emerging markets are still not doing very well, with an exception for India maybe, which is not a very much export-oriented country. Where is the world's growth and how does it impact the profit of companies when dealing with third parties, but also with other group companies? When we look at where the growth is in the world today, we have to look at how the growth has moved in the past three to four years. The global growth again fell short of expectation in 2015, decelerating to 2.4% from 2.6% 2 in 2014. The disappointing performance mainly reflected the continued growth deceleration in emerging and developing economies amid a post-crisis loss in commodity prices, weaker capital flows and modest global trade. Global growth is projected to edge up in the coming years, reaching 2.9% in 2016 and slight higher growth of 3.1% in 2017 and 18. So it appears that the numbers are growing. This pickup is predicated on continued gains in major high income countries, a gradual tightening of financing conditions, a stabilization of commodity prices, and a gradual rebalancing in China. Numbers will be growing subject to where commodity will go, or rebalancing of China and as indicated, for 2016, there is some growth, and for 2017, the outlook will be slightly better. This will impact on m and borrowings from third-party financial institutions and result in a different set of terms and conditions for intercompany financing. The underlying problem, which has plagued the global economy since the crisis, but has worsened slightly, is lack of global aggregate demand. 
More realistically, large corporations are sitting on hundreds of billions of dollars, trillions if aggregated across the advanced economy, economies, because they already have too much capacity. The export sector is getting smaller and smaller. China, for example, has less demand for raw materials, impacting countries at exporting commodities to China. So excess capacity, low demand, and China is mo moving to a consumption society. Another point is that in many countries, labor laws are difficult. Hiring conditions, wage levels, etc., are negatively impacting long-term growth of companies. The European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, the Federal Reserve, they are the three key players and they try to control the economic malaise with expansion of monetary policies. While they initially were limited to government bonds, but they started to put more and more money into the market. We have seen from 2015 more negative rates. In fact, the central bank is pushing for negative rates. So we see the overall interest rate environment goes down and the expectation is that more borrowings will take place, which would help economic growth. Monetary policy is good, but at the same time, structural changes are needed as well. Overall, the sentiments are low. There is a lack of demand, low price levels and low profit for companies. It is a vicious circle and difficult for companies to come out of that. Deeper is the micro malaise in many sectors like in shipping, where most shipping rates are low, particularly by the mistaken expectation that China would keep on importing ever more commodities, power industry, semiconductors and retail, and, a and the companies in these sectors struggle to get things right. This drives a demand for greater monetary expansion, but new investments should happen in high growth industries together with structural changes on labor laws, etc., as just mentioned. This could complement then the monetary expansion and serve the need for improving the economic climate and the global market. Another reason, reason for impacting the global economic climate is climate change. JP Morgan Change, Chase, one of the big, world's biggest banks, is to stop the direct financing of all new coal mines and new coal power plants in rich countries in the wake of the global climate agreement concluded during the climate conference in Paris last December. This is also impacting how financial institutions will finance the companies active in the mining industry, if they will still fund them at all. These companies might not be able to get any external financing anymore or only against very high interest rates. JP Morgan will maintain corporate lending relationships with big mining groups that produce a range of commodities, including coal, but will not provide specific project financing to develop new coal mines. As a result, this could also impact the intercompany financing, as companies in this industry might not be able to get financing from banks anymore. Given these facts and developments, what would be the immediate impact on intercompany financing? We have to look at the global down downturn that is happening since 2008. In 2012, GDP growth was still going down, but for 2016 and 17, growth is expected again as we saw. The question is if intercompany financing should be revisited in this context, but this will most likely not be appropriate in the next one or two years in view of such short term of growth. It is too difficult to say at this time and more structural growth and other structural changes and improvement should happen. Still, repricing of intercompany financing arrangements is an important and also very much practical question for companies. They have to deal with long term, maybe expensive loans as agreed during growth years cash pooling model, treasury department, in-house banks, etc. 
Um, but perhaps a distinction should be made between Europe and the emerging and developing countries. The interest rate decrease looks at least structural in Europe. This is not or not yet the case in the emerging markets. For example, mortgage rates in Europe are currently fixed at historical low rates for 10 or 15 years. So probably in the longer run, intercompany financing needs to be revisited. This might put many intercompany loans on the water, especially in view of the zero or even negative interest rates that we started to face. Um, we are now at slide five. A cheaper currency remains an important tool for central banks in sparking domestic demand. Lowering the value of the currency should raise inflation by increasing the cost of imports. While the euro initially weakened, recent moves have had little impact since the US Federal Reserve signaled it would slow the pace of its rate hikes. The Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank and other central banks around the world, like in Switzerland, Sweden, Denmark, have introduced overnight negative interest rates in an effort to bolster growth and raise inflation expectations. The ECB acted last March when it pledged to buy another 20 billion in bonds each month as part of its landmark quantitative easing package. From this April until March next year, and possibly beyond, the ECB will buy 80 billion worth of mostly government bonds each month. It will also buy high-grade corporate debt. ECB became the first major player to experiment with negative rates in the summer of 2014, when it began to charge lenders a levy of 0.1% a year on deposits parked in its coffers. Since then, it, was cut rate, it has cut rate another three times, most recently in March, and the deposit rate is now minus 0.4%. The Bank of Japan is also convinced that January's move to rates of minus 0.1% is working, despite the fact the first few months of the policy have been rough. In Sweden, the Riksbank has warned that it could cut rates deeper into negative territory, as it battles to improve the inflation outlook, despite skepticism of what impact it will have, given that rates are already at minus 0.5% and the economy is booming. In the wake of the financial crisis, Denmark's National Bank was the first to go negative in 2012, to defend the long-standing pact between the Krone and the Euro. Many Danish banks, such as Danske, have started charging their biggest corporate and institutional clients for depositing cash, and Swedish lenders, such as CB Bank, have started discussions with similar clients. After all, if the banks themselves have to pay 0.75% in Denmark's case for depositing cash at the central bank, then it makes sense to share some of that burden. And yet, in none of the economies attempting the unorthodox experience of experiment of negative interest rates has there been a return to growth and full employment. All this information about the ec economy, about the behavior of financial institutions that caused the crisis and, and should therefore be more regulated, the, the final bad reports of last year, all, the, all this does not give an answer to companies what to do in practice and how to price, price into company arrangements. What would be the right price of guarantees, for example? There is a lot to do about the theoretical aspects. We hear so much about BEPs, that you need substance, where do you have significant people functions, the introduction of a maximum gap on the group of, of interest deductibility, but there is hardly any practical guidance. On the BEPs, this is mostly still to be issued by the end of this year or in 2017. Alternative ways to look at pricing of intercompany financing could be by looking at the government, for example, dependent on the risk of the type of bonds, what is the government and how does it correlate to others. For pricing purposes, it can also be helpful to check balance sheets 
capital requirements, liquidity ratios, and also categorizations of the different functions, assets, and risks, dependent on the level of the functions, risk, and assets of an intercompany financing setup. The compensation should then be different. In the same way as banks and other financial institutions should be categorized as recently proposed in the initial report on the investment firm review performed by the European Banking Authority. Likewise, intercompany financing arrangements should be differentiated. Luan will, by the way, talk further about this later in this webinar. Tax authorities might start looking at the compensations of intercompany financing with focus on capital, and maybe we should use these indicators and the financial regulations and EU directive on this point, also in the transfer pricing documentation. There are the official sources, like the Markets in Financial Instruments Directive 1 and 2, and the Capital Requirements Directive and Regulation, and there are statistics. As a condition for an effective and valuable search and comparison, the transfer pricing system around financial arrangements have to be well structured, I think. Compliance with capital, capital and liquidity rates, etc. So a solid base should be there on which the intercompany financing arrangement is built like uh, the minimum substance requirements that should be met based on the regulations from the Dutch Ministry of Finance by intermediary financing entities, for example. Although this will now be tackled by BEPS as well. Once the intercompany fin financing arrangement is set up in compliance with regulatory and financial regulations, then try to come up with more appropriate benchmarks that are put in a broader perspective than just searching for comparables and benchmarks in databases. The industry analysis is still equally important, not only to describe the industry in which a company is active, but also by looking at the banking sector in that specific industry and, and country or countries a company is active in, which can also give interesting insights in how to deal with intercompany financing in a specific industry and can be of support and value and can be used to complement the findings on comparable benchmarks. We go to slide six implications. Many of the existing intercompany loans were agreed between group companies during growth years. The prevailing weak economic climate has eroded the profitability of some MEs and consequently, in certain cases, has eroded their equity position, making their existing debt position highly leveraged. In addition, some MEs were refinanced through new debts, which triggered a similar too high debt leverage position. The prevailing weak economic, econom, <laughs> economic climate and a, and a series, series of BA's data points from publicly available databases has exposed many existing intercompany loan arrangements to be not in line with the arm's length principle. The changes in tax and transfer pricing rules brought by the OSD Debs project has created a sense of urgency for MEs to revisit their loan arrangements in order to be sustainable going forward. That raises serious concerns regarding MEs compliance with the new OECD rules and requires them to review their current debt positions. Loans which are creating such underwater positions in terms of their inability to fulfill the debt obligations require a reset in terms of the level and the conditions of debt instruments. Theoretically, the riskier the investment is, the higher the return that will be expected by the lender. In a weak economic climate, policymakers create monetary conditions to lower the general level of interest rates to stimulate growth. This creates a low interest rate environment overall, also impacting interest rates on intercompany loans. 
the third party data available on interest rates on financial databases shows that anything beyond 8 to 10% interest rate cannot be supported anymore by empirical evidence. There are a few exceptions. For profit participation loans, interest rates are higher, but the empirical evidence in the public domain, even databases, is lacking. Where an interest rate above 10% is being used in today's set of rules and empirically available data points, such payment will easily obtain a hybrid nature. In other words, the 8 to 10% interest rates found in the public domain are heavily biased by the regulatory defined reference rates, like LIBOR, EURIBOR, etc., and therefore are not a fair reflection of the true economics of most intercompany loans. However, tax authorities um, claim these BAS references are solid and the best evidence in today's markets. The BEPS action plan requires the taxpayer to support the arm's length nature of intercompany loans beyond the, beyond the synthetic approach by providing empirical evidence and other trails relating to people functions and corresponding risks in relation to intercompany funding. Therefore, it would be important for the lender to maintain an audit trail on critical functions and risks assumed in relation to the intercompany loan. For instance, the number of FTVs on the payroll of the lender, a credit, credit worthiness analysis of the borrower conducted by the lender, evidence of negotiation of the clauses to the intercompany loan agreement, etc. The inability of an m &E to provide evidence to support the functionality of the lender over the whole period of the loan could either leave the lender with risk-free return and or disallow interest deductions beyond a risk-free rule at the level of borrower. Um, and with this, I would like to hand over to Luan now, who will continue with uh, slide seven. Thank you, uh, Marju. Um, yes, I, I think that uh, the topics I will handle will somewhere and somewhat uh, interfere with what Martin said, and that's also the, the idea about this, this webinar. Um, but uh, just uh, adhering to the strict, uh, strict uh, consequence of, of slides, uh, we will uh, pursue with slide seven. And slide seven is about enemies' uh, main concerns maybe going forward. And you see in slide seven that is a couple of pictures uh, about interfering uh, items, topics which um, may have an influence on the MA's policy and strategies required in the future and also uh, during present time. Um, main elements are substance, capital requirements, identification and allocation of risks, pricing of financial guarantees and pricing of interest rates. It is, it is clear to, to, to all of us that the, the BEPS uh, developments, together with other developments in producer, the, produce, producer uh, supervision and otherwise, may have uh, imperative influence on in what uh, yeah, people uh, within an enterprise may decide upon. For instance, a substance. Substance is a, is a concept from, from general tax background, which puts down the the idea of having having uh, people in place in a certain uh, location, which are directing the, the, the daily operations. Capital requirements is more more uh, yeah well capital related. That means that you have a certain substance, but that is a substance which can can relate to uh, having uh, equity power or debt power to to pinpoint whatever is needed to uh, keep the um, M&E going forward, and also the SME. And then allocation of risks. Yes, risks um, is one of three items, risk, assets, and functions. This is very important, but it is also important in relation to the uh, famous action 8 to 10 of BEPS, which are uh, concentrating in various places on risks, 
and the risk mitigation, the risk allocation, also risk identification, which is important, which can on its turn interfere with the people functions and also with the assets. And assets can be part of assets can be capital requirements. Pricing of financial guarantees um, um, relating to famous um, court cases like the, the Chevron case in the Australian tax office. Um, there, the, the guarantees, uh, uh, yes, that that Chevron case was um, ending up with, an, with a victory for the uh, for the administration. And well, yes, uh, because the the the, the financial tax uh, tax payer was not able to to uh, sub substance to to to, uh, to, uh, to bring forward the main evidence uh, as, as to comparables and other guarantees modes and then the, the, that is very important as a, as a part as a as a moment in which uh, uh, guarantees can be brought forward as a practical application of what is what is it at the, at the core or at the center of enterprise focus and then also the price of interest rates the Arrows, which have been uh, signed uh, uh, in, the, in the lower part of the slide, are the benefit test, the long-term deferral of taxation, control over risk, control of dual resident entities, overuse, misuse of tax treaties, cap interest deductions of the group, location of significant people functions, and tackle taxation of uh, interest lookalikes payments. Now, the benefit test is also uh, looking to the uh, the, the benefit for the, for the enterprise of having a tax planning structure. Long term deferral of taxation is, the, is, is um, looking at uh, yeah, the, the postponement of taxation uh, by uh, creating tax planning uh, structures. Control over risk is uh, a sort of uh, extension uh, of tax planning. Uh, based of risk allocation as we spoke before control of dual resident entities yeah that's at the core of, of BAPS and it is, it is just one of the more malignant uh, uh, structures which have to be uh, had to be um, attacked during uh, on, on the basis of the, of the BAPS uh, uh, action plan overuse misuse of taxi that's about uh, uh, the limitation of withholding tax Cap interest deduction of the group you are is referring to the action four. Location of significant people functions, that's eight to ten, perhaps eight to ten, maybe mostly the, 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 the nine action and tackle taxation of interest lookalike payments, that are the, uh, the other one, the, 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 the uh, lookalike payments like swaps and um, um, profit uh, participated loans, uh, guarantees, we spoke about that and other similarities to the more orthodox interest. If we look about, if we talk about what's, uh, which uh, kind of uh, type of, of, of enterprise activities are very important in this connection, these are intermediary financial vehicles. So like um, cash flow, um, cash, cash flow intermediary, um, Companies which are put into interposed between between lenders at the one place and borrowers at the other place, and then the cash flow entities are interposed at a third place, and then cash pools. Cash pools are very important because cash pools can be can can look uh, about uh, physical cash cash uh, uh, notional cash uh, cash uh, um, pools and physical cash pools, which can look uh, see uh, what what cash pools uh, at, the, at the end of the day that can can not like a yeah a, a star a star which is in, in imploding so a cash pool can also implode to a one a one point uh, uh, position which is very simple to uh, to manage and that can have a, a very important Position and also uh, in, in interaction with, with 
what is in uh, uh, the, yeah, the cash uh, interaction of um, uh, financial streams and short and long term loans and profit participating loans. Um, looking into uh, to this slide, we can derive from the, the typical situation which uh, Mars also uh, has uh, related to the third party data available on interest rates on financial databases shows that anything beyond eight to 10 interest rates cannot be supported anymore by empirical evidence. And Marty, Marty in the, uh, with reference to the so-called um, uh, uh, hybrid nature, eight to 10 interest rates could be found in the public domain are heavily biased by regulatory defined reference rates and that could be uh, labor LIBOR and EURIBOR say, uh, and uh, therefore another fair reflection on the two economics, see uh, refer to that. Tax authorities mostly based on the political ground can claim this bias references are solid, the references from LIBOR and EURIBOR, they are lower and then the best evidence, but that's not enough. People have to like to, to, to to, to uh, leave the synthetic approach and they have to, to follow the other trails and to provide evidence to support the functionality of the lender over the whole period of the loan and could either leave the lender with risk free return or disallow interest rate deductions beyond the risk free rule at the level of the borrower. Um, I think we go to the, to the next slide, which is slide eight. And slide rates is about the collateral effect, uh, which on the long run I see says that IC financing will be affected by the same or similar events that are currently redefining the banking and the finance industry. And that could be end up into higher capital requirements, higher liquidity ratios, which are always uh, set for banking institutions, but now have a more wider implication for the whole industry. Categorizing firms based upon their risks and systemic importance and tougher application of guarantees schemes. If you see this uh, collateral effect, uh, we can look at a lot of developments which have been um, reflected into uh, the EO stand, and they, the EO has recently, and that is a hot topic, um, uh, set new production frameworks for EU investment firms. And that producial regime for investment firms, not for banking firms, because banking are already under the regulatory uh, regime, but for investment firms is undergoing a fundamental review for the first time in 20 years. 20 years ago, there was a so-called MIFID one that is the Markets in Financial Instrument Directive. It sets rules and the potential scheme for banking institutions. But there is a briefing note from the EUK, which is relevant for all non-bank firms undertaking investment services and activities regulated under the Markets in Financial Instrument Directive. That's the uh, the the, 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 the abbreviation is my fit, but it is called Markets in Financial Instruments Directive. And that's my fit too. Under the, over the years, the potential regime for MIFED investment firms has grown into a complex framework primarily designed for banks. That is the so called Capital Requirements Directive and, re and the Capital Requirements, requirements Regulation, which has become overly burdensome for non banking investment firms and does not address their specific risks, but now it does. In light of this, the uh, capital uh, requirement regulation provision allowed for the European Commission to undertake a fundamental review of the overall potential framework for investment firms in consultation with the European Banking Authority. And this, this is the European Banking Authority, the authority which have set out this uh, a potential framework for non-banking institutions being investment firms. And the first output of the work is that the EBA, the European Banking Authority, published its initial report on the investment 
Fairview View in cooperation with the European Securities and Marketing Authority, the ESMA, that was done on the 13th of December 2015. Highlighting the complexity of the existing framework, the report sets out the background on how investment firms are categories for potential purposes. It then analyzes the firm's risks, current requirements, and how they apply across different firm types, their inconsistencies and shortfalls, as well as potential policy options. And the EPIA proposals sweep recommendations for the next stage. First, establish a new framework for categorizing firms based on their risk and systemic importance, distinguishing between bank-like firms under which the full CID CRR would apply, non-systemic firms, and firms with non-interconnecting services. That's first. Second, develop a new potential regime for non-systemic and non-interconnected firms, and third, extend the CRR, so the, the CRR exemption for commodity trading firms until the new regime is in place, or at the latest, until 2020. And then, the, the, the review uh, highlights selected areas of the European Banking Agency's report on practical challenges that arise from interaction with other EU legislations, such as the Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive and the forthcoming Basel development. We know Basel 1, 2, and 3 set um, also potential uh, uh, borders for equity, uh, for obligatory equity for banks and banking institutions. And now the investment sector is at stake. Um, the scope and producer categories are set uh, to make a split between eight categories, although I don't want to, to enumerate all of these, but they are for instance, the portfolio management, um, underwriting, and operation of multilateral trading facilities. The EBA recommendations in this respect are a small minority of bank like firms which are deemed to be systemic or systemic banks. We know that from the banking crisis are the most dangerous one among us. And these firms would be subject to the full CRD and CRR regime. The non systemic firms, for which a less complex regime is to be defined, addressing market, credit, operational, and liquidity risk, but they are less complex and so are less addressed in, compar in comparison with the bank like firms. Not the banks itself, but the bank like firms. Smaller and non interconnected firms, third category, which could be subject to a simplified regime based on fixed overheads and large exposure requirements. Uh, both qualitative and quantitative parameters for determining the, now, the new categories are yet to be defined. And then the risk analysis, which are very important and very core to the, the, the uh, potential regime to be instituted. These uh, are market risks. And market risks, uh, it's not relevant to firms engaged in propriety of the trading. But it could also arise under other circumstances where a portfolio manager, portfolio manager within an investment institution is running box position or an agency broker and is left holding position due to, for instance, failed trades. And also in the case of firms that solely deals on own account, which is not a category, one of the eight, the lines can be blurred between two stinting regimes where a firm meets the, the CRR definition of a local firm, it is not deemed to be an investment firm for CRR purposes, it will only be subject to a lower minimum requirement, for instance, by 50,000 euros. But on the other, on the other hand, a firm failing to uh, a certain article of the CRR uh, would be subject to a much more onerous regime, and yet both types of firm do not generally serve external clients and share common features such as transactions guaranteed by a peering institution. 
Well, that's a market risk. There's another risk, lax exposure and concentration risk, which is can be particularly relevant for firms that operate in small niche markets and are therefore more susceptible to client concentrations. And firms with smaller balance sheets for which large exposures can arise simply from this depositing cash with a bank and the ABA provides an overview of the current large exposure regimes, discussing upcoming developments at the EU and Basel levels, and highlights the number of issues to be considered in the instrument investment firm review. And one of the issues discussed is whether it would be appropriate to exempt certain types of firms from the requirements. In the past, asset managers argued that their large exposures would normally arise from accrued client fees and that the rules therefore penalize success. However, these firms would still be exposed to the failure of their clients and that of the banks where their funds are deposited. Another potential solution, the European Banking Agency proposes granting an exemption to certain types of exposures under specific conditions rather than a blanket exemption to certain certain types of uh, firm, a lighter regime would be applied to non-systemic and non-interconnected firms, the second and the third categories this, uh, discerned by the EBA and by the, by the European agency, while the full regime would apply to bank-like firms. So another, another time, not banks itself, they are out of scope here, but bank-like firms. Now, in the last issue, we raise the titles for investment Treatment of investment firm exposure is exposures to clearing members. The question is whether there should be an exemption or exception similar to the treatment of firms exposures to central um, to central firms. It has indicated that this is more relevant to the firms that is not in scope for the EU recovery and resolution framework. Okay. Um, Going back, well, last point in this case, in this that MF MIFID II is currently scheduled to come into effect from the 3rd of January 2017. However, ESMA mentioned before has indicated that it might be necessary to delay until 2080 or beyond. More generally, firms that are in scope of CRD4, that's a more advanced uh, uh, structure of this uh, CRR and CRD uh, um, <clears throat> regulations. So more generally, the uh, films that are in scope of CRD4 still have to the challenge of complying with new technical standards and new areas of the rules that are transitioned in such as capital buffers and so-called pillar two. There is a pillar one, that is an equity pillar and a pillar two. In addition, those firms will be affected to some extent by the forthcoming Basel developments. So Basel developments in, a, in this own, in our own um, situation will also um, set new guidelines for the banking. Basel developments are for banking. It will run um, parallel, parallel with the investment potential regime set and which I spoke about hitherto. Okay. Um, Going back to the slide presentation, I think I will go to slide nine. And slide nine is now the source of all, regulating the banking and other financial institutions sector. And if we see the blocks near, uh, next to each other, um, well, this is summarizing which I spoke uh, about in the, in the foregoing minutes. It's the EU capital requirements. This is Basel III, up to Basel III as the, the latest one, the uh, for Basel IV to VI and, the four, and, and forever. The capital liquidity and leverage ratio, that's all Basel III and further on, and counterpart credit risk and capital buffers. So, in short, credit institutions, building societies, and investment firm, firms, and then the potential regime, now summarized here in the, in the second block, categorization of Firms, degree of compliance with CRR slash CRD, commodity trading firms which had to be exemption to till 2020 or, or, or earlier, the new regime is coming into existence, 
and the guarantee schemes, uh, which have, are, will be focused in, in particular and um, in connection with the your students, uh, among other the, the, the Japan case, and maybe the old uh, GE case from Canada, which uh, in which the taxpayers uh, on the on the situation and the, the case. The last one regarding BEPS 224 and BEPS 8 to 10 action points. People functions control over risk, economic over legal substance. These are 8 to 2. Action 4 is groups deductibility cap and 2, yes, uh, that can be the, the um, uh, yeah, the, the, the planning uh, in, in, the, in the hybrid structures, which can also come into existence. Also, three, it's not mentioned here, that is uh, C by C, uh, uh, CFC relationships. So, this uh, this month in the the, the, <clears throat> the yeah, how do you call it? The, the capital, uh, the banking, which uh, have been set into a into a sort of um, uh, other country uh, country company, which have to be looked through as a piercing the view and clawed back to the the base country, and for instance, the United States or the, the, the United Kingdom or so on. Then the tense that's the last. Slide regulatory framework. Understand the game and its rules to foresee the future of intercompany finance. Well, that's about. It's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, circles. MEs are focusing on treasury finance departments, and it is uh, yeah. And then the, there are four blocks in the first circle. EU capital requirements, uh, we spoke about that, the BEPS 2 to 4, the MIFID, uh, the third uh, quadrant, and the prudential regime for investment firms. At the left side, the international regulatory bodies, that's the whole uh, framework. At the right side, banks or other financial institutes to undergo this, this body. And then uh, the accolade is uh, encompassing the span of loopholes which can be Amplified or it can be narrow in this part, and well, that's uh, depending on which entity is at stake and which um, dangers have to be uh, have to be uh, uh, structured and have to be uh, disguised and to to be seen and to be uh, focused uh, by tax authorities or by tax payers, whichever is at at stake. Um, it is to conclude the presentation. I think that um, the background of all of this is that that the economy, and that's what Marty has talked about, the economy is slowing down. Uh, people are uh, thinking that the, 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 the ECB and other central banks are looking about uh, leveling up inflation, but the deflation is settling at the, at the corner. And it is still the, we have still to wait for the uh, the economy to, to to grow up, and then I think that all these points will be so sol solved uh, in itself, and will be, be be a subset of what the, the economy um, in in a more all comprising uh, situation, which will set up uh, uh, the the. The BEPS uh, structure and also the potential structure and also the, the Basel D structure in, in total. So I think that this is what we have to look about, and this is what we uh, will maybe in other um, uh, webinars uh, talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Luan. On, on our last slide, on slide 11, you will find our takeaways that we think are key. Uh, you should rethink, uh, evaluate existing highly leveraged positions. You should examine uh, loan arrangements where the interest rate is higher than 10%. Um, we also think you should start applying a new approach involving all the trails with empirical evidence. And uh, last but not least, you should check whether existing financial structures 
are not being taxed anywhere. Thank you. Uh, dear participants, if you have any questions, you can uh, type them in a, uh, in the box with questions or in the chat box. Uh, we have, I think, we, yeah, we have still 10 minutes to answer your questions, so please feel free to ask. Okay, since there are no questions for now, so thank you for attending the webinar and we hope to see you again. Thank you.